And as much as we say there's neither male nor female, that's true in Christ. But there's really male and female. And we are not female men. <laughs> And there is a very definite difference, and we're all grateful for that. <clears throat> and then there are those of the same sex that speak very differently. And uh, the, the wonderful thing about coming to a conference is that you have a variety of speakers. And if one of us turn you off, then just sit tight. And the next one will come on and turn you on. And that's, uh, that certainly is our intent. But I hope that you have noticed that it really is one message. Have you noticed that? There's no conferring. We don't even get together with the musicians and talk what we're going to preach and how they're to coordinate. Uh, we just trust the Holy Spirit to do that. And many of you have spoken to us as we speakers, as we have walked the campus and said, these are the things that God's been saying to us, or uh, I've not been totally clear on some things and God's just brought it all together. That's the beauty of the teacher. For there's only one teacher, his name is Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad for him? And so just simply, just to kind of, and I don't ask for this slide, I don't care what he says, I didn't ask for this last word slot, but just to kind of pull it together, because I'm a woman under authority, I invite you to open your Bibles to Hebrews, and we're going to read a couple verses from chapter 5 and then go into that wonderful chapter 6, chapter 5, verse 11. He's talking about the priest. Melchizedek, that order, the greatness of Christ and the exceeding abundant above all of Jesus. And then says, the writer of Hebrews says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. Please understand it is not sinful to be a baby if you are a baby. We have almost made it a guilt trip for people who are new in the walk because they don't know some things other people know. And, and God help us to remember that this has been a walk. We didn't jump into some things. So if you're a new Christian or you've just been spirit-filled or you're just even looking toward that and you don't understand some of the things that have been said by speakers, please don't feel guilty about that. And also please don't uh, feel negative against the speaker. Just leave it and say, Lord, I don't understand what that lady was saying, but maybe someday I will, and if not, maybe someday she'll quit saying it. Verse 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised that they can discern both good and evil. Therefore, because of these things, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. We have a tendency in looking at chapter 6 of Hebrews to believe that these things we've just mentioned and read are baby material, that these things are not important. 
And the reason that, that so many people say, well, this church is so locked into laying on of hands and all these things, the reason that they don't understand that is that they don't realize the purpose of chapter 6 of Hebrews. Chapter 6 of Hebrews, when it names these things, is not talking about the Christian's view of them. It is talking about the Judaizer's view of these things. Everything uh, that, that is spoken of here in the book of Hebrews is this message. Now listen, and I think I can um, oversimplify for clarification. It starts out, the book of Hebrews starts out by saying, God, in a lot of different times, in a lot of different ways, has attempted to reveal his son Jesus. That's what the whole message preceding mine was about. God, in various ways, has attempted to reveal his son Jesus. God in diverse manners and diverse places, it says in, in the beginning. Then he goes on, the writer of this book goes on to say, let's talk about the things that, that you know from Old Testament. Let's talk about the shadows. Let's talk about uh, types. Let's talk about everything that was intended to represent someone real when they arrive. Let's talk about them because those were the beginning steps toward this moment. I said to you, we're entering a third day. I was cautious in my saying it because I know the tendency to make a doctrine out of every statement that seems to be vital. It's a thousand years is as a day with the Lord. We've had 2,000 years. We're ending into a new dimension. Uh, there's been war forever in the church about the word dispensation um, and all the rest of it. What I'm trying to do at this last few moments is unravel some of the complexities. Really, the word is not as complex as we try to make it. If we understand the intent of it, the intent of the word is a revelation of Jesus Christ from Genesis through the book Revelation. That's the total intent of the word. It's sad that man has not seemed to be capable of grasping that simplicity. And so it was, and you see it periodically in Paul's writings, that he had to go back over and over and say, Who hath bewitched thee? Why have you returned to Judaistic teaching? The Pharisees were the teacher of Judaism. Now, you need to know that so long as Christ was a promised seed, all of the, the uh, Judaizers, all of the Pharisees loved him. You can't say they were anti-Christ against him. They were not. They looked for it. You can't say that of the Jewish people today. They look for a Messiah. They want him as a promised seed. You okay? And the writer comes on here and says, let me tell you about the superiority of Christianity against Judaism. This isn't the teaching of immature Christian things that are being done that when we get deeper in God, we will no longer do these things. That's not what this is saying. And as long as the enemy or your mind can keep you thinking that, you will fight the things that are vital to your growth in the Lord. As long as you think you have to leave uh, to go on to, to the, uh, the perfection, as long as you think you have to leave these things, repentance and all these other things, you'll never go on to them. Now, what is it saying then? Starts out and it says, uh, don't return to shadows. Don't return to your limited revelation. Don't return back there to the old forms. Don't try to rebuild some kind of a foundation that's already been laid. He is speaking to people who have already accepted Christ. 
This is written to believers. And he says, you've already accepted Christ. Why do you want to go back now to forms about him? He says, you need to leave repentance from dead works. We don't ever leave repentance. From glory to glory, from glory to glory, and I've already told you that I, there's a repentance level between every growth that I've ever experienced. But it is no longer a repentance from dead works. That's flesh, that's concern, that's earning processes. D do you see the difference? In the law, under the law, they had to do absolute. There are still people in the church that don't understand service. We serve because we love. We are servants by choice. That's Christian service. But the serving, the works under the law, you do this and you don't do that. And if you violate this, you repent from dead works. That's legalism in its fullest form. And one of the things many years ago that the Lord showed me about the body of Christ is how guilt-ridden she is. That ought not to be. If there's one thing Jesus came to do, it's alleviate guilt. We ought to be the one people on earth that are guilt-free. We ought to get up every day of our lives and say, Hallelujah, I'm rightly related to God, and this is the day. He said, you've got to leave that repentance, the, the, the inefficacious works of, of flesh. You never could do good. Why do we spend our lives trying to earn it? That's the law. That's not the spirit. Second thing he says, after he talks about the foundation, that's really the first. Don't try to relay the foundation. It's already there. You found Christ. Second thing he says is, leave this repentance from dead works. Then he says, leave the doctrine of baptisms. Oh, my, as long as we see this as Christian baptism, which we believe in. We have a baptism into Christ. That was John's baptism that baptism of repentance, water baptism. We have spirit baptism. There's a baptism of suffering. Then there's a baptism of fire. We don't speak a great deal about that, but we do experience it anyway, whether you talk about it or not. Someone said, well, will that fire hurt me? I said, it depends on what you're made out of. If you're steel, it'll harden you. If you're wood, it'll consume you. If you're clay, it'll set you. And so on and so on. But we believe in those baptisms. Baptizo, it means literally to, to bury into some kind of an element, to be buried into Christ, to be buried into the Holy Spirit. Don't ever leave that. That's a reality of your life. It's those who believe this is a, a legalistic approach. Well, what are they talking about here? He's talking about all those symbols of cleansing. They baptize their pots and pans. You see, this, this whole Judaistic thing came into being between Old Testament and New. You understand that? God, God set up all the symbolism to reveal his son in the Old Testament. And when it didn't reveal his son to the majority of people, the only thing they knew was that they had a desire inside to worship something greater than them. And so they decided how to do it. And it was then that the laws started being written. Well, if we're going to please someone greater than us, here's what we have to do. And they began to write, now listen to it, laws which interpreted the law. In one case alone, I just looked up one law one time for, for a research thing I was doing. There were 260 interpretations of the law, of that one point. 
260 thou shalt and thou shalt not to try to bring light to one statement of law. Does that tell us man doesn't know diddly? <laughs> because the purpose is revelation. Everybody see it. The purpose is revelation. And it is at this point that we come, we look at this, and it says, if you want to grow up and come on to perfection, you have to leave some things. You can't just go on saying, well, I'll cleanse this. And all of those of us who have traveled overseas and have gone over to Israel and, and seen the ceremonial baptizing of feet and baptizing of hands. And some of you have come out of churches that still do it. In order to be clean enough to go into the church, we have to wash our hands and so on. It says you have to leave those things. You've got to understand that in Christ you are totally cleansed. We're not cleansed by some little piece of water. We're cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes right on along this line and says, and you have to leave the laying on of hands. The last thing I ever want to do is leave the Christian's view of laying on of hands. If you read about it, you learn that the laying on of hands blesses people. It consecrates men to service. I mean, scripturally, we use the laying on of hands for ordaining. How many believe in the laying on of hands? We, we believe in laying on hands to impart spirit. Jesus laid hands to bless children. Some of you mothers need to learn to do that a little oftener. Oh, I'm really serious. I don't mean the whipping laying on of hands. I mean the blessing. You don't realize that that which is in you, the Holy Spirit will minister through you as you lay hands on your children. When my son was, was full grown and out of school, I used to go in when he was asleep and lay hands on him in his sleep. And I'd say, God, this one's yours, 100%. Do you understand what I'm saying? We believe in the laying on of hands for performing of miracles. All of this is scripture. I'm not bringing church doctrine. This is in the word of God. We believe the laying on of hands for imparting gifts. The Holy Spirit, that's why we call people forward and say, let's lay hands on them. There is something that stirs in another when the spirit in me is given opportunity. So the writer isn't saying, we got to leave the doctrine of laying on of hands and get so mature we don't need anybody to lay hands on us. What he's saying is, you for years have seen it practiced and have taught from Old Testament that if you have sin, you lay your hands on bulls and goats and impart your sin. If you want to give an offering to the Lord, a burnt offering, you do the same. You lay your hands on bulls and goats and you impart your life into that bull or that goat and then it's cut up and laid down. The, the pertinence, the head, the legs, all separated until the whole whole carcass is consumed, the ashes are then precious, picked up, spread before the Lord. He says, don't you understand that's symbolic? Are you okay? You look, you don't look so good. <laughs> say, well, we lost an hour of sleep. Hey, so no sympathy for you. You shape up. <laughs> It, that once we come into the freedom and liberty and we're there a little while, we panic and want to run back to things that were symbolic. And that's what the writer's saying. You want to grow up? You want to become mature, perfect in the Lord? You have to leave these things. They say, well, we want to go back to who I like it when I think in terms of what my great grandparents did. I just need to get a bull or a goat in here. He says, you're going to have to leave that thing. You can't impart sin by doing it. And there are a thousand other things that, if time permitted, I could, I could bring to focus here this morning in, in saying that it isn't just bulls and goats, but we like to do it other ways. There are people that have to get saved every week or so, or they don't feel saved. And there are some people that have to have a prayer line or they can't get healed. And, and all the symbolical things that are at times a part of our lives. And, and the writer is saying, it's Christ. It's just Christ. You've got to touch him. These are all all right.
right. But he's greater than everything, don't you understand? The whole purpose of the Old Testament is what the writer is saying. Everything you've written laws about and added man's so-called wisdom to is, is minimizing that he has already come. Resurrection of the dead. That's a tough one, isn't it? Is it or not? I mean, isn't it a little difficult to think that we have to leave the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead? How many believe the dead are going to be resurrected? Then you don't want to leave it, do you? I mean, honestly, from a Christian's point of view, is there any difference then between the Christian's point of view and the Judaizer's point of view? They believe in the resurrection of the dead. When Lazarus was dead, and Jesus showed up, and Martha is weeping, and Mary's weeping, and everything. He said, to, Jesus said to Martha, do you believe? Do you believe that, that your, your brother can live? Oh, she said, yes, indeed. I believe. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I believe that in the last day he shall be resurrected. There are thousands of people calling themselves Christians who still only believe in the resurrection of the dead. The difference is this. A Christian who has heard with the ear of the Spirit Jesus say, I am the resurrection and I am the life doesn't just limit their belief to the resurrection of the dead. They believe in the resurrection from the dead. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. How many of you are resurrected right now? From the death. The psalmist cried in one of his psalms, Oh, God, the dead praise not. I don't know if he knew how prophetic that was. <laughs> but you can go into certain groups and or churches, and there's no praise. Lots of petitioning, lots of concerns one for another, but no praise, and there's no life either. Do you understand that? Jesus came that he might resurrect you from the dead. He might lift you out of the dead past of your life. He might make all things new in himself. And today we live, and that's what Paul said over and over. He said, don't you understand? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it's not me. It's Christ, the life I now live. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We ought to be the most alive people on earth because we believe in the resurrection from the death. Our hope is not deferred, if that is true. Oh, the people that are hopeless today. Last year, my ministerial focus some of you will remember, was on healing, hope, and holiness. The Lord said, those three things I'm going to bring back to my church, healing, hope, and holiness. In the preaching of that, I discovered how many Christians were in hopeless situations as far as they were concerned because they'd never learned to be resurrected from the dead, from the situation of death. We can live today out of that. It isn't a matter of succumbing to it, and, and being depressed, I never met, have you, Dr. Cutley, so many depressed Christians as I have in the last few years. Church, that ought not to be true of us. We've been resurrected from that. Don't you let yourself be overwhelmed with dead thoughts. We are alive people, alive church. And th the Bible says that blessed are they whose minds are stayed in the Lord, blessed with what? Peace. It says blessed, or actually the actual words are great peace, have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, 165. Nothing. How 
How can we ever get to a place where nothing offends us? We heard a bit about that this morning. In fact, we have heard it all along. It's by the recognition of the purposes of God. Nothing can change God's purpose for my life. His intent is to do me good. I look for good. I expect good out of ashes. And when the old enemy comes in and starts to depress, he loves to release the joy from God's people because joy is one thing the world does not possess. No, they don't. They have happiness from time to time upon occasion, and they pay for it the next morning. <laughs> but the joy that the church has is strengthening. It strengthens us. We're filled with it. It's a state of life. It's not a giggle and a laugh. It's kingdom living, right relationship with him, not going back to laying on of hands and, and, and baptisms, not going back to washing things to make everything pure. Well, of course, how we do that is the do's and don'ts. Depends on what church you go to, what sin is. <laughs> but that's the legality. Yes, it is. The Holy Spirit within is the one that convicts of sin. And he also convicts of righteousness. That's when the Holy Spirit says to you, you're all right. Hallelujah. People are pointing their finger, you're wrong. Holy Spirit says, no, you're right. How many understand that? How many need to understand that? You need to have that, that sense this day that the Holy Spirit says, you're right where I want you to be. You're doing the right things. You can trust me in you. That's this maturity that's being spoken of here, being resurrected from all the dead things of the past. I don't care if you're still among people who are dead, you can be alive because you've been resurrected from it. Glory to God. And then he says, if you're going to go on to maturity, you've got to leave what you call a doctrine of eternal judgment. Whoa, that's a dangerous. You mean there's no eternal judgment? You mean once we get really mature, then we no longer have to worry about eternal judgment? No, but the Judaizers only saw the legality of God's righteous nature. And they said, woe unto you if you miss the mark. There's coming a day, and some of us grew up in this kind of teaching, there's coming a day when he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, and he's going to look down at you, and he's going to see all those wrong things you have done, and he's going to say, you're on the left side. How many grew up with that fear? But when we come into Christ, when we really come into Christ, Christ in us, when we come into Christ, do you understand that? We don't fear the end time. The only thing that's going to be judged are my works. And the only reason they're going to be judged is to know what the reward ought to be. What do you think it means when you're saying, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. You are all my righteousness. I stand complete in you and worship you. What does that mean? Well... I'm a sinner saved by grace. <laughs> what it means is, if Christ is in you and you're in Christ, you don't have any fear of meeting God on that judgment day. You have an excitement about it. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Thrilled and delighted. How'd I do, Father? Everything okay? I'm not worried about these other things because I'm in Christ. He's the perfect one. I know he pleases you, and I spent all that time down there in the nursery <laughs> getting 
seem to look like him. How much do I resemble him, Father? Do we look a lot alike? That's all I want to know. I don't expect him to say, you were doing fine up to a week ago when you told that lie. <laughs> Off to hell with you. <laughs> but that's what the Judaizers taught. Remember, how many of you learned to pray, if I should die before I wake? I pray the Lord, my soul to say. We lived in eternal insecurity. <laughs> Scared all the time. I might not make it. Our testimonies, I remember for years, they go like this. I thank the Lord for saving me and healing me and baptizing me. Pray that I'll hold on till the end. <laughs> How many remember those? Some of us are still hanging on, too. I, used to, I, I, I remember this prayer request. Just pray for me that I'll stay in the way. <laughs> All of heaven are going, reject! We're trying to get her out of the way. Christ we live. We've sung it here, even in this very conference. In him we live. Zoe, have our life. In him we live and move. Instead of staying in the way, we're moving. You know some things this year you didn't know last year. You'll know some things this fall you don't realize you know now. You will. You'll be talking along to someone and they'll say, Where'd you learn that? Oh, I've always known it. <laughs> Isn't that true? Because when I see it, I think I always knew it. People say, that's not what you taught on your tape 10 years ago. I say, burn it. <laughs> what the whole book of Hebrews. And by the way, Hebrews means crossing over. You like it or not? That's what we're talking about, right? Let's get on with it. So, we will not move on to higher ground until we cross over. Over preconceived ideas, past comprehensions, etc. Everything we thought we knew has to come to a place of laying it down. You can't go until you leave. <laughs> you got your cars packed. How many of you got your cars packed already? You're all ready to go, but you're not moving. <laughs> it will take some leaving us for you to get where you're going. Is that true? And I know that's extremely simple, but it isn't so simple to do because what you've had here has been good. We think that the only way, only things we have to leave in order to mature are wrong things. Not true. Listen to the words. Joshua, yes, Lord. Moses, my servant, is dead. Does Joshua know that? He's not a moron. He probably spent 30 days grieving. Why does God have to tell him that? Well, first of all, they can't find him, so they could be unsure. <laughs> but maybe another reason is, do you realize, Joshua, that the good old past is dead. It was good. Moses was wonderful. What a man. Oh, what a relationship he had with God. How God trusted him. How he led the people out of captivity and toward the future of possession. 
the things he placed within them in knowledge and wisdom and understanding and corrections and purity. Who could fault it? What a pastor. Hmm? But there came a time when it ended. And whether you can believe me or not, and I almost hope you can't because then that'll prove you don't understand it because you're not having the problem. There are many people today who have a longing within them for more of God, but are unwilling to let go of the good old past in order to reach for them. Fearful! If I let go of this, oh no! Some good things in your life you have to let go of in order to go on. You were saved. That's wonderful. You're being saved. That's more wonderful. You shall be saved. That's it. Do you understand that? So you don't have to come down and go through the whole thing all over again all the time just to make sure. Those of you that made a reconsecration, you made it following a statement I ask everyone to make, if you recall. And the statement was, I'm in this for the duration. Now hang on to that truth and don't let the enemy take back from you what is real, but leave it now and get on with it. Why do you have to leave this meeting? This is wonderful. Let's build three tabernacles. <laughs> I'd like to. I don't very often get to be with colleagues. I'm usually out there alone. So you forced me to grow because I tell you everything I know every year. <laughs> so we must leave this place that we may what? Good word. Try it again. Grow. grow. We're not going to grow here. We don't have to grow. There's no conflict here. I love you. <laughs> we love each other. Kiss, hug. You don't know anything about me. I don't know anything about you. It's easy to love you. <laughs> you think I'm wonderful. I'm not going to tell you different. You love me. <laughs> we don't have any yelling kids or telephones or staff members or anything else to bother us. We're just worshiping Jesus. <laughs> love. He says, that's good. You got it all together, pack it up. <laughs> oh, Lord, this is the mountain. He says, no, this is the valley. I brought you here so I could send you to the mountain out there where you really learn it. I know it seems like this is the mountain because it's fun and we think that, you know, that's fun. There's no climbing to get here. <laughs> Just sit down and we cram feed it. <laughs> this is an easy place. People talk so much about living on the mountain. Hey, it's a lot of work up there. It's harder to breathe. You got to plow to get up there. And then you got to readjust everything. <laughs> Listen to it. The promise is in three of this book and verse 14. We are made partakers of Christ if we behold the beginning of our confidence, hold it steadfast unto the Lord. That's where the tale is told. When we leave here and hold steadfast, I've found something of Christ I didn't have before. It's going to work at home. It's going to work in the church. It's going to work wherever I go. I made a statement in my beginning that the Pharisees loved Jesus as long as he was the seed of prophecy. 
From Genesis to Malachi, there was this promise, this prophetic utterance, the seed is coming, the seed of David is coming, the seed is coming. In the Gospels, the seed comes and dies. In the Apostles' doctrine, following resurrection, the seed lives. A lot of people just stop there, the resurrection of Christ. But from Romans to Jude, the seed speaks. And in Revelation, the seed reigns. Why do I say that? It would be easier if I would just leave you there and we'd shout and go to lunch. But it would be unfair and an unfair exegesis of these few verses if I didn't say the purpose is that we become what the seed is where it is. How many got it besides Charleston? <laughs> you can always tell when they get it. It makes a noise. They go, ah! Oh. Everything Christ is, we're to become, true or false? But we become it in Christ, true? All right. First, there was a promise of us. We heard about that this morning. In the mind of God, if you will, we were coming. We're predestined. Do you believe that? If you don't believe in predestination, and I know that's a word people are scared of because they can't spell it, but it, <laughs> just forget that word. Let's just try. I don't believe in predestination. It was God's intention. For me to be alive today. Do you believe that? Yes. Good, we're together now. So I got to just talk long enough, you get there. I was but a promise for a while. And then I came. And when I came, there was a life to prove my existence. When I accepted Christ, that was life abundant, all right? Now, at some point, if I am to be what he is, the seed has to what? It has to die. Why must we die? Well, because we won't be fruitful. Oh, come on, that doesn't really make a bunch of sense. To me, just plant me and water me. I don't want to think about it. I have to die. The reason we must die, and oh God, please give them understanding of this, is that every truth, every revelation we receive, we will focus on ourselves until we die. Without Jesus being the life, if it's still Iverna that's so vibrant here, I will somehow twist and distort every revelation that comes. And I'll go out of here saying men are inferior to women. Wait any sin. Do you understand? And we'll go home and start sharing that and you'll slam a lot of doors in your face too, because that wasn't the message at all. I'll go out of here and I'll take someone's faith message and I'll say, I can make things happen, I got faith. Let's see, what do I want to happen? <laughs> I'll listen to someone's message on power and authority and ruling and reigning. And I'll start figuring out who I'm ruling. I'll listen to someone talk about the privilege and the prosperity of the believer and I will go home expecting to become rich. Are you hearing me? I'll hear a message that came forth this morning about God wanting sons, many sons that look like his son. 
And I will try to become that in the natural, and that's what violated and, and, and tainted the message that we know so well as the manifested sons of God. Scared to death of it because it was taken to a, an extreme, and they tried to become it, some of them. Do you know who I am? I'm a little Jesus. That's because the seed didn't die before the revelation came. I just have to die. Not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. It isn't how much knowledge I can jam between my ears so that I sound impressive. And it isn't that I can glean all this knowledge intellectually, put it on a piece of paper and weigh it out and say, oh, I see here, yes, I've, I've got this figured. Okay, God, you wanted me to be born? Fine, and that part's done. <laughs> it is what some of us feel when we hear a message like that. God, I can't. I'll never look like him. I just can't do it. You don't have to lift your hand, but how many of you felt that way this morning? Oh, that's my destiny. I'm going to live to be 8,000. <laughs> I can't do it. He says, that's exactly what I've been waiting to hear. I don't want humans who can live Christian lives. I know the innocence of this error. Did that commu communicate to you? I've lived there. Yes, I have. I've had a portion of my life. When I ordered my life in his footsteps by grit, and I won't say by what, by everything I could, just, I will. I will not smoke, drink, cuss. In my church, if it was fun, you knew you couldn't. <laughs> I am a Christian. See it? <laughs> and I'm not speaking to sinners, because I have no fellowship with them. <laughs> they want my Christ, they come here. It's no wonder we haven't preached the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. We've been protecting ourselves for years. We've been more afraid of contamination than loose to illumination. <laughs> One day, as I suppose everyone must, everyone who, quote, in my circles, we use the word backslides. You don't slide back, you walk back. I came to a place where I said, I can't live this life. I'm through. <laughs> and I walked away. And then I realized I had to learn how to sin. <laughs> I didn't know how to do anything they do. <laughs> it's hard. It really is. And they don't want you. They don't want you out there. You're ruined. <laughs> I did the things they did. I'd sit there at a card game, and I was fairly good at bridge. I'd sit there, and I'd watch them looking at me. <laughs> and somebody, we'd just be in conversation, and, and somebody would say something about their life, and I'd say, you need Jesus. And they'd say, what? And I'd say, I forgot. You're really weird. I think, I know I'm weird. I can't make it here, and I can't make it there. <laughs> All right, let's wrap it up. <laughs> Some things are important. Lunch is one of them. <laughs> so I died. 
I came back to him and fell. I fell into the ground. And I said, I can't live a Christian life. He said, I know it, but I can. And when that seed came in me, I began to live resurrection life. Now, he says, you must speak. The seed speaks. Speak what I speak, that's all. Don't add to it. Don't take from it. Just speak what I speak. And I will live within you, says the Holy Spirit, and I'll tell you what to say. You don't have to try to figure it out so that you say it so eloquently. I will in that moment give you those words. And we began to speak. He said, the time will come when you will also reign. But we're not there, so get off the throne. Now, what does it mean, speak? We're all going to be preachers? Well, in a, in a way, yes. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. In that way, we're all preachers. But here's the message of speak. It's become a priest. A priest spoke to God on behalf of the people, but that was only half the duty. They also spoke to the people on behalf of God. Does our speech speak on behalf of God? Does everything I say exemplify him? What's God saying today? He's saying, see my son, see my son, see my son. My very speech has to be something that reveals Christ, not preaching Bible scriptures, but responding as Christ. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Let your words be seasoned with salt and grace. You kids, shut your face! <laughs> I'll come up there and you wish you had. <laughs> now you get ready for church! Listen to it and I'll close. We have not an high priest who is unable to be touched Are you? Are you so hardened to the scene around you that you have no feeling about it anymore? Are you touchable? Or is there such a wall built around you that it's an invisible sign that says, leave me alone. I'm just not a hugger. We'll teach you. We have not an high priest who is unable to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Why does he have to say that? Because the Old Testament priests were unable to be touched. It's the New Testament priests that can be touched. Hallelujah. That's the voice of love that comes forth. When the seed dies, it lives, and when it lives, it speaks. But it must speak as he is speaking, and he is speaking as priest. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Listen, don't leave. 
as a priest, when I count to three, I want you to name the church you're attending, and we're going to intercede for it. One, two, three. Eagles. In the name of Jesus, let there come fresh revelation to this church. Let the power of the Holy Spirit become its influence. Let the softness and the grace of God be poured out. Open the revelation of truth to every leader there, I pray. How many children do you have? Lift that many fingers. I'm going to lift one from my grandkid over here. Go ahead. Got him up? You're a priest now. We're touched with the feelings. Father, we're bringing our kids and grandkids to you right now. And we pray that you'll help us to communicate with them the Christ that lives within us. I pray you'll reveal to them Jesus Christ. Give understanding, oh Lord, and witness to them. And lastly, I want you to name your husband. I pray that as these women return today, it will be light and salt and illumination. I pray for every unbeliever that he shall be unable to remain in that state because of the presence of Jesus in that home. Hallelujah.